Well, what a privilege it is to be here with you today, SUM student body. My name is Manny Pena. I'm the lead pastor of Lux Church in Richmond, Virginia, but I'm also a fellow alum um, pursuing my master's here at SUM along with you. Well, today we're going to talk about a topic called first priority. You know, we're going to uh, delve into this idea of what do we hold uh, as the greatest priority in our lives. I can assume that God is at the top of, the, of our priorities for we're here passionately pursuing a faith that seeks deeper understanding. Um, but with this, I want still to give us some places to consider how we might be able to even still grow deeper in making sure that God is first in all of our priorities. Let's start in this space here. Why do most churches start their services with music? Is it just the way we do things? Well, partially that might be a reason, but could there be a deeper meaning as to why? Well, there is power in music. I think we can all agree with this. Before God created everything, he set music aside. Maybe he did this because he loves to sing. Pastor Manny, where are you getting this from? Well, one of my favorite passages of all time is found in Zephaniah chapter 3 and 17. It says, the Lord God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Did you hear this? Our God will exalt over us with loud singing. What a humbling thought that the God we praise sings over us loudly. You know, this reminds me that anything that is good and holy is not initiated by us, created, but it is always initiated by creator. So God sings and we respond in kind. And there's more to it even still. Psalms 100, 1 through 2 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Now we see God singing in Zephaniah initiating and now we see the psalmist responding to the song of the Lord with his own song, with our own song, if you will, even now. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come to his presence with, here it is again, with singing. So we're told to come to the Lord singing. Again, Psalm 22.3 says, yet you are holy enthroned, making your place, listen to this, speaking of a dwelling, an inhabitant, God makes his place in the praises of Israel, in the praises of his church, his children, his people. David is saying that God literally lives or shows up in the praises that his people give him. However, as we learn this, we need to understand that the most important factor for worshiping God isn't that we sing, that we praise, that we clap our hands. No, our highest priority is the condition of our hearts. The word worship is defined in one way as to regard with great and extravagant respect, honor, and or devotion. In order to worship God in spirit and in truth, we, by definition, must lavish God with our spirit. Before we panic because we have no idea how to do this or what it might look like, let's take a breath and relax. Because in Romans, Paul gives us a great example. Romans 12 and verse 1 answers this for us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, listen to this, here we go, which is your and our spiritual song. We see here that setting ourselves apart by the help, of course, of God's spirit, by obedience to his given word, we offer our lives as worship. We offer our lives as sacrifice that would be holy and acceptable to our God. This I find to be beautiful as well as powerful. Again, in the Psalms, we read in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are this, a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
Again, we realize that the worship we bring God has less to do with the instruments we play and the actions of our members of our body, but more to do with the connectedness of our heart to the greatness of God. We are called to humble ourselves and obey the Lord to seek his face. And my next favorite scripture of all time is found in James 4, 8, that lets us in on the greatest invitation of all, that if we draw near to God, that he would draw near to us. And let me stop here for a moment, lest we somehow believe that we're initiating again something that is holy of God. You see, God has already drawn near to us. We've seen it throughout all of the Old Testament, uh, 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 bringing its pinnacle, paramount uh, uh, apex in Jesus Christ in uh, the new covenant. He has drawn near to us already. He hasn't met us halfway so that we might now reach the other half. No, by no means uh, of the imagination ought we believe this. God has drawn near to us fully. He has come all the way through the cross through the resurrection, through the ascension, giving us his Holy Spirit. He's come all the way. And now in this, what he's doing is inviting us to recognize the extravagant work of grace that he's given us and that we might accept this work that he has accomplished for us. So again, we have this invitation to draw near to God. And he promises And how can we hold him to this promise? Because we've seen him stay true to his promises for thousands of years now. We see it in the word that the words that he speaks to Israel, the words that he speaks to his children, he is faithful and he is just to fulfill them. This is our worship. And this is where our power is is found. It's found in recognizing the power of our God. Well, let's connect this in a way. There's a game that we've played with uh, many youth groups and even uh, corporate gatherings or leadership trainings. And this game is a way that we can come to get to know one another. Uh, It's a game where people ask each other questions to get to know each other. It can be funny and they can participate with strangers or even friends that they might consider to be their BFF, their best of friends. And yet, even if we are doing this game with best friends, we will realize that there's still much that we can learn about each other. The point of this game is to learn at least one new thing that we didn't know before. Well, then we pull the group back together and we find out then what we've learned. And as we go around the room speaking and sharing about what we've learned, we now all grow in deeper understanding, relationship concerning the members of the class, the group, etc. Well, what's the point? The point of this game is that whether we play with someone we barely knew or we play with someone that we've considered to be a best and close friend, Everybody has an opportunity to learn something new that we did not know before about that individual. There is always an opportunity to go deeper with the relationships that we have, not only naturally, but as well as spiritually with Abba, with our father who has pursued us since the formation of our being. As it states, we were fearfully and wonderfully made We were a thought in God's mind uh, before we were a consideration in the mind of our parents. This God that has pursued us, that has shown us and drawn near to us in love is desiring so too that we might make our pursuit of him our first priority. You know, it may be obvious, but for some reason we find new things out because we're trying to. Yes, it's not by happenstance or an un, un, uh, unintentional uh, 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 happening. No, it happens because we intentionally set out. We intentionally pursued deeper understanding, greater knowledge for the purpose of growing in deeper relationship. Well, so too it is in our relationships on earth as well with our relationship with God. Now, here you are in seminary, learning, going deeper. And some might say, 
This is my intentional pursuit of God. And yes, I believe this for it's part of my pursuit to know God more. But yet, even in this, as we go through and have papers to write and multiple pages of books to read and and oftentimes can become a bit stressed uh, with the work that we have, we we must be reminded that this work is holy and that sometimes we have to put the work aside and just spend time with Abba, spend time with God. It is in the same way that, again, our pursuit in relationship with those that are around us is to be, if not even with more intentionality, with God. God wants to have deep, meaningful, intimate relationship with you and with me. He wants us to get to know Him. God wants to walk with us through every day, every moment, sometimes even literally. Well, what do you mean? Well, in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve uh, 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 sin. They, they sinned and, and this marred humanity and brought separation between God and man. But it says in the moment of their sin, God came down in presence, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This leads us to believe that this was a normal thing, that God would come down and walk with Adam and Eve every day. For the duration of the Old Testament, this type of relationship for the most part was lost to the staggering majority because humanity could not stand now with God. Sin uh, created a chasm that separated man from God. John 15, 15 in the New Covenant tells us this though. Now, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have now called you friends. For all that I have heard my father, I've made known to you. With Jesus' sacrifice, an individual who is saved has an incredible privilege to walk with God in friendship again and to learn to know His voice. There is no greater calling than to accept the invitation that we spoke of in James 4, 8, to be nearer to God, to be found continuously in His presence. Now, how do you and I become friends with someone if we don't talk with them. It's the same with God, except we should realize a few things. Shift our perspective a little bit further. We generally hang out with people because we enjoy them for a number of reasons. We find them funny, smart, witty, amiable, easy to get along with, into maybe the same things as we are. Even we might find them attractive. Now, God is the inventor of all these attributes. In fact, they all come from him. He came up with humor and the greatest sport of all, football, arguably, I should say. We have an incredible opportunity to be friends with undoubtedly the most amazing being in all of existence, as well as the most beautiful being of all of existence. The source of all things amazing is God. This is the catalyst, the spark that ought to uh, 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 cause us to desire to pursue God with our first and greatest priority. So take some time and get to know God. Pastor Manny, I'm in seminary. I'm doing that now. I know as I am, but there's something that cannot be substituted with the intentional time to spend with God, not solely for the sake of learning and presenting a paper to fulfill a grade, but spending time with God because He's beautiful, because He's amazing, because He's awesome, because He is God. Talk to Him, read His book, talk about Him with others, Invite him to share life with you and begin to share this incredible experience with others. You don't need to have a mindset of, I must read my Bible uh, this many times throughout the day, or I must pray for exactly three hours and 46 minutes, or have 13 page prayer lists. No, you can free yourself from that type of mentality and find time to befriend the most incredible person ever that has given us the invitation to be near and permission with high honor 
and privilege to call him friend. I think of the psalmist that says, who am I that you are mindful of me? This brings great humility and contrition. And as we read earlier in Psalms, that a humble and contrite heart, the Lord will not despise. The grandeur of our God ought to put us in the perfect posture to be able to not take for granted the friendship of God. That he is altogether holy, he is altogether creator above creation, but yet he has chosen and given us provision and made a way for us to intimately know him and wow, call him friend. David found himself in this exact place of realizing that there is not a greater privilege than to be with God. Before doing for God, we must be found wholly content with being with God in his presence. David writes in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, David isn't literally saying that he wants to be in the church building all day. No, but that which the building creates space to fulfill. The building creates space for intentional people to come and recount and remember and celebrate the goodness of their God. To worship him and praise him, to be convicted by him and to enter the joy of repentance. In this idea, David says this heart attitude I want to carry with me all the days of my life. That sanctuary is not relegated to a place, but it is the manner in which I live. We break the sacred and secular divide and we live our life as worship unto the Lord. That the world might desire the desirable one. That the world might see another way of living that might persuade some, if not even many, by God's help and the help of his Holy Spirit to say, what must I do to be saved? Now, what might be some next steps towards affirming God as our first priority? Well, let us with the Holy Spirit test and scrutinize ourselves, our lives, our actions. Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 7. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find that we have not failed the test. You see, Paul is saying, let us live a life of scrutiny. Not in a manner of which would condemn. Romans 8, 1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But we hear Paul saying, hey, scrutinize your life to confirm that you are in Christ Jesus. David then goes on to say in Psalm 139 and 23, search me, O God. I see this as a correlation of Old Testament scripture uh, echoed again uh, uh, through Paul. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me or test me and know my thoughts. Matthew 22, 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And so many of us, uh, as we've entered our Bible college and or seminary and theological training, we've learned that it is a, a noble and even holy a journey to learn what it means to love God not only with our heart and with our soul but also wholly with our mind to love him is to obey him and to continually seek of him and his kingdom first above all other pursuits which in turn transforms the seat of desires in our hearts to be fully desiring of the king Today and forever, let us make it the ultimate pursuit of our lives to be pursuing the one who is worthy alone and above all other possible pursuits. And that we, like David, may say, I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will wait for the Lord 
in the power of Christ, I will be strong. My heart will take courage as I wait for the Lord. And in this we say, SUM student body, amen and amen.